the concept of, of failure and challenge is really one that has resonated with people. You know, there's the um, Japanese saying, and I'm gonna hold up my Daruma, uh, fall down seven times, get up eight. These guys are weighted at the bottom and represent that um, of the tenacity and patience we have to have to move forward. And, you know, this has been a challenging year for, uh, for, for everyone in different ways. And so how can we see challenge and setbacks um, as an opportunity for growth as well and see sort of, I guess, the beauty in the challenge. And, and granted, there is <laughs> some challenges are bigger than others, but, but how do we keep going forward? Because that's what life is about. So how do we keep getting up um, and moving forward? And so that's been a big lesson. Well, I don't know if it's a lesson for me, but it's a relearning and a deeper appreciation for that concept of what it means to fall down seven times and get up eight and the inspiration that other people have had from that experience. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Swan. And I'm Tracy O'Rourke, and we're from the Just In Time Cafe. Welcome to our podcast. At the cafe, we wrestle with tough questions, talk to thought leaders, discuss great books, and get insights from Lean Six Sigma practitioners. We let you in on helpful apps, we bring you the news, and challenge the status quo so you can build your problem-solving muscles. Hey, Elizabeth. So what's on the cafe menu? Today's highlight is our interview with Katie Anderson, author of Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn with Iseo Yoshino. Katie celebrating the book's one year anniversary and a lot has happened since then. Uh, we'll talk about that with Katie. We'll let you in on an app that connected one remote team better than when they were working in person. And for Q&A, we asked our community how they retained what they wanted to know. Journals, phones, drama, and digital pens are just a few of the techniques we learned about. So stay tuned for all of that. It's a great day at the Cafe Tracy. Yes, it is. Up next, it's Hot Apps. So you recently heard about this app from a colleague or from someone you were coaching, and they said that using it pulled their team closer during COVID than when they were able to meet in person. Is that right? Absolutely. So I was connecting with a black belt that I'm mentoring at UC San Diego, and he mentioned that he feels more connected to his team now than when they were sitting together in close physical proximity. And that struck my curiosity. So I said, well, what are you doing different now? And he said they schedule team bonding time. So they didn't do that before. And what do they do at that time? Well, they actually play games and they do this once or twice a month. So that's when he mentioned that they use Jackbox TV. So we talked about that for a few minutes and then I checked out the app and thought I'd share it here. So Jackbox Games is the party game making studio best known for hit games like you don't know Jack, Quiplash, or Quiplash, <laughs> Fibbage, Drawful, Trivia, Murder Party, and more. They've got drawing games, writing games, trivia games, and hidden identity games. There are lots of games to choose from. And I'll be honest, many of them I never heard of before. Although I could probably guess what it's about based on the game title. So games like Gespionage, Word Spud, The Joke Boat, Dictionarium, and lots of trivia games. So it's kind of like the equivalent of announcing family game night and opening your closet door to see the board game stacked up high on the shelf. And then you can decide on what game to pick, but now you get to facilitate these games virtually and no party goer gets left behind. For Jackbox games, your phone or tablet is the controller and up to eight people can play. The main action of the game happens on your TV or wherever you launch the game. But players use their own mobile devices to input answers and make choices. All the Jackbox games are rated T for teen, and many games have a family-friendly mode. Those are things I care about as a mom. Only one person in your group needs to own a Jackbox product in order to host the game. But there's lots of things Jackbox TV can do, and I was quite impressed. What else did you discover, Elizabeth? Well, I discovered... <laughs> When you first told me about Jackbox TV, I had no idea what you're talking about. And then I looked it up and I realized that I played one of their games over 20 years ago. Uh, it was the You Don't Know Jack, their hit trivia game from the late 90s, which is hilarious. 
Uh, and then I realized I'd also played one of their games during COVID this winter. So my husband, fam my husband's family set us up with Quiplash by Jackbox. And it's the one where you compete to come up with the best quip or line based on some topic. And I will confess, I consider myself to be good with the line. So it seemed like kind of a no brainer for me, but my husband's family is ridiculously funny. So I lost, <laughs> lost the game. Most times we played it, but I laughed my butt off and it was really fun. And we started meeting more often. And even before we said we should get together, we would reach out to my niece's husband to say, because her husband ran the controls, he must have bought um, the uh, Quiplash. And uh, we were like, can he, can he set us up again? You know, we were a little like laugh junkies, uh, which cracked me up. So I looked it up and there's more games like the ones you mentioned. I'm particularly interested in the trivia murder party. I feel like I've stored a mountain of arcane knowledge in my head over an entire lifetime. So I can really only use it on crosswords and party games. So I say, bring it on. Uh, I also found on their website that these, these games originated as education focused trivia, you know, exercises on CD-ROMs, you know, and then there was the popularity of online gaming and the evolution of technology. So their latest incarnation is what they call party packs, those multiple packs of online games. So you can buy a party pack that has three games in it for 29 bucks. And when we played uh, with my husband's family, we were on Zoom. We received separate prompts and input our quips on our phones, like you described. And then the results played on the screen. And it says you can also use a Twitch stream. And I'm not even going to pretend <laughs> to know what that is. And you've also got options of the platforms you want to run it on. You could, we used a laptop, but you can use gaming consoles like Nintendo, Switch, uh, Xbox One, PlayStation 4, streaming devices like Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV. So you've got options. We have tutorials, instructions, seems pretty affordable. And it definitely made me appreciate my in-laws. So I can see it would be really good for teams like the one you described. Are you telling me you didn't appreciate your in-laws before that? <laughs> I loved my, I love my in-laws. Sometimes they listen to this podcast. So <laughs> just want to be clear how much and deeply I appreciate them. They're awesome. And we'll go ahead and, and include the link on the podcast post on our website so you can check it out and you can appreciate your in-laws too. I'm Elizabeth Swan and you're listening to the Just In Time Cafe podcast. In a short while, you get to hear our interview with Katie Anderson about the wild ride of a year she's had since writing her book with Mr. Yoshino. She's developed a series of workshops based on what they uncovered together, and there's a new audio book coming out. Next up, it's a question we pose to our community. What habits do you have to remember what you wanna know? The origins of this post came from wrestling with how to deal with my personal journals. And I've got a stack of them in the attic. I don't really want to reread them, but I don't want to destroy them. And then I thought, why don't I want to reference them? And I realized, oh, they're probably full of angst and probably too much useful navel gazing. And that got me thinking, what would I want to read? Why don't I capture things I want to reference or go back to? Like when my memory fades, what stories or facts do I want to have access to? So I started capturing stories and moments that I wanted to reference when I'm a, a little old lady who needs a laugh. <laughs> but that, you know, it's funny, but that changed my attitude toward my professional notebooks. And I've got over 50 notebooks. I've spent over 30 years refining my methods for capturing what I want to retain and recall every day. I plot out my to-dos. I write down what I learned from the previous day. I capture conversations. I write notes from books I'm reading. And it made me want to know how other people capture the things that they want to be able to recall. I read How We Learn by Benedict Carey, one of the books I kept a lot of notes on. And he cites research that shows we learn more when we write things down. Even when we try to underline or highlight things in books, it doesn't help us retain what we're reading. What but writing things down makes a difference. I heard a quote recently from Mark Rosenthal that sums it up really nicely. Ink makes you think. 
How about you, Tracy? Well, I can tell you right now that I hardly write anymore. And when I write, my writing is so bad. I can't even read it anymore. It's, it's almost like my hand forgot to write and it's all cryptic. And so anyways, I'm really not enjoying the writing part as much. You know, I'm much faster typer. I actually, for the first time, I haven't been on site with a client in a long time. And for the first time I did go on site and I was actually typing real time, just looking at my client, not even looking down at the paper. And that was so much more efficient. <laughs> right? And so I was really like, I didn't even know I could do that, but I'm so used to typing now. <laughs> that I'm really good at it. <laughs> but you know, I think it's a very interesting book, how we learn. My curiosity is, I wonder what the results would be now. I mean, most people are typing and watching videos and we're all strapped to our computers. And, you know, I find that I have random pieces of paper everywhere and I, I basically will type it into my computer and, that, and then I could get to throw it out. Um, but uh, so th I wonder what would happen now. So, and then I started reflecting on when I am on site and when am I learning? Um, and sometimes when I'm on consulting gigs, and you've seen this because we've worked uh, together for many years at Schwab, uh, at a client. <laughs> and, you know, when I am fully engaged talking with people, I spend very little time writing things down. I'm usually really present, just listening and paying attention. And I might keep a couple of notes after the fact, but I don't know what it is. I just absorb it. Um, and I was able to do that really well until, until I had my second child. And then I don't know what happened. <laughs> I had to like come up with a new plan because I couldn't remember anything, <laughs> but I do believe that how we learn best is different for everyone. Um, I think the most important thing is to recognize how do you learn best? And sometimes that changes and then channel that, like be, be aware of it. And then how do you leverage it so that you learn the best in your best way? Because I think everybody learns differently and my learnings really happen kind of all over the place. So it doesn't happen just at my desk. So writing things in a notebook isn't as effective for me. I've resorted to creating a system on my phone because I don't go anywhere without my phone. And I've also been kind of trained to capture things in pictures, trained by my family, right? Because, you know, I got to capture that moment. You know, they're only going to be six years old, you know, one time in their life. And so I'm trained to capture picture, things in pictures. And then even at work with social media and posting, I've been trained to, you know, capture things as well. So what I do now to document my learning is I capture things in photos. So no matter where it is, it could be a handwritten note, a picture of a person I meet with or their business card. It could be pictures of a presenter at a conference or some of the slides they're showing. Even on my phone, I'll take a screenshot of a meme or on a, like a Facebook post or a LinkedIn post, and then I'll save it. And I'll take pictures of everything, even written notes. I'll take hand, uh, pictures of handwritten notes or whiteboarded stuff that I'm, I'm doing. I'm always just taking pictures of everything. And then I try to create albums for those pictures by event or by date on my phone so far so that I can find it at some point. So that seems to be working for me because, you know, I don't always have a notebook and um, Gemba Walk, same thing. I found I was taking lots of pictures, not taking as many notes, just a couple of notes on my phone. So that's about it. Uh, you do take pics and I so appreciate your pictures. You've often got records of people, information that I am really grateful for. So keep doing that, Tracy. <laughs> and I know you're right about everyone being different. And that's why I put the question out there to find out what works best for others. You know, what are people doing? So let me relay some of what I discovered from our community. Uh, Lynn McLaughlin, she's an author and the host of the podcast, Taking the Helm. Uh, she said that journaling led to the publication of two of her books. Uh, leadership co coach Dorsey Sherman, she keeps a separate book for each client and for different types of work. She also uses color-coded tabs for different coaching clients. Uh, a number of people clued me into something called Rocket Books. And I heard from website designer Aisha Cargill, Kata coach Gemma Jones, uh, and also Chris Burnham, uh, who's a podcaster, about these notebooks where you use digital pens and these reusable notebooks. So I had Gemma show me, you know, what they look like after at least three people posted about them, which I had no idea what they were. So she showed me the book 
And she showed me the pens she uses. She's got different options of both colored pens um, uh, if she wants to do things in color. And once she's written something down, um, then she can use a, a code to upload a digital copy uh, wherever, she, wherever she wants it. And then she wipes it down with a special cloth and she can use it again. So it's, I'm a big recycler and this is a very green method of taking notes. I mean, I feel, it made me feel bad for the 50 notebooks that I'm looking at adding to. They're filling all of my drawers and uh, bookshelves. So, uh, but an aspect of this is having good handwriting and that same uh, leadership podcaster, Chris Burnham said he didn't use rocket books because of its issues with his handwriting. So uh, I'm not gonna recommend it for you, Tracy, but anyone who's seen uh, Gemma's work, uh, her beautiful drawings uh, and uh, her handiwork would guess that she has impeccable handwriting, uh, which she needs for these. Knowledge management expert, Cindy Young, she leaves herself a voicemail or she asks Siri to capture what she wants to remember. Either way, it ends up on her phone. So she uses her phone kind of like you do or in another way. There's a versatile app called Evernote that lets you categorize information on your phone in any format you want. We got that from Chad Mullen, who is a service de uh, delivery manager at Nimble. But our good friend and the co-author of the Toyota Way to Service Excellence, Karen Ross, says she doesn't take notes when someone is talking because she's paying her full attention, just like you, Tracy. And if she wants something verbatim, she takes a photo. Again, just like you, Tracy. But what was new was that if she wants to remember a technique, she tries it out right away. She knows she learns by doing, as most of us do. So she cements it in her mind with action, uh, which is direct and to the point. And I love that. Yeah, that's actually something I do, too, because even this Jackbox TV, I just found out about it yesterday. <laughs> And I'm like, let's look at it. Let's see what we can learn and let's share it. And so that action behind learning something and trying to, you know, get more familiar or comfortable with it is something I do as well. So Karen and I have a lot of the same learning channels. Anyways, Elizabeth, I really loved your LinkedIn post about this. Um, I was happy to see it. And it sounds like other people see value in sharing and responding to your post too. So thanks for asking the question and sharing some of what people had to say about it. Welcome, Tracy. I'm Tracy O'Rourke and you're listening to the Just In Time Cafe podcast. We, hope, we host these monthly. So you can go to www.jitcafe.com and go to our podcast page. Coming up next, it's our featured guest, Katie Anderson, co-author of Learning to Lead and Leading to Learn. Tracy, why don't you tell our listeners a little more about Katie? So other than the fact that she is an awesome person and one of our dear friends, Katie Anderson is an internationally recognized leadership coach, consultant, speaker, and author of the book you just mentioned. Her best, she's best known for her focus on helping individuals and organizations lead with intention. Katie has supported thousands of leaders across a range of industries, and she's lived in seven countries. She leads study trips to Japan for leaders looking to deepen their knowledge of lean leadership, the Toyota way, and Japanese culture, and we took her up on that, and we're going to talk about that with her as well. Katie holds a BA with honors from Standard Stanford University and was a Fulbright Scholar in Australia, where she received her master's degree in public health from Sydney University. She currently lives in San Francisco Bay Area with her husband, two boys, nearly a dozen chickens, and hundreds of Daruma dolls. Well, hello, Katie, and welcome to the Just In Time Cafe. We are so happy to have you. I'm so happy to be here with you, Tracy and Elizabeth. It's, I don't even have my coffee here ready to, ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are so glad that you could come because it really has been a little while. I think the last time we saw you, you had just written your book, and now it's been a year since the release of your book and you have 
been a bestseller in over seven Amazon categories in the US and the UK. It's been a whirlwind of virtual book tours, conference spotlights, podcast interviews, all kinds of stuff. What has this year been like for you? Well, for it's super exciting that we're coming up on the books one year publication. And yes, we had um, our last conversation for this show was 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 with Mr. Yoshino just after the book uh, came out, which is uh, which was a whirlwind, and especially a whirlwind in a pandemic as well. You know, certainly publishing at a time when we all were you know virtual was it was a shift in mindset and approach too you know we had planned on having all these you know in-person events and you and I Tracy had talked about some events down in San Diego and other things but you know what it has been an incredible experience um, not only to have the great honor to have partnered with Mr. Yoshino to learn from him and craft this book from all of his stories and lessons and, and bring it forward and now also to be able to amplify the messages by connecting with so many audiences around the world. I've done so many webinars and keynotes and gone to speak to book clubs who have been reading the book. And I was really inspired um, actually through all my conversations with people about how the book was touching their lives and the reflection questions that I have that in the, at the end of each chapter that I decided to create a workbook too, to help people even go further. So that's been a super fun um, project that I did at the beginning of 2021, which is um, this companion workbook, which is fun to look at if they kind of mirrors each other with the same look, but different colors. So I flipped it, um, the, the warp and the weft. And that's been really nice way to bring in some of the, the things that I talk about from a coaching and leadership perspective and marry it up with the stories and lessons from Mr. Yoshino's time. So it's been a really great experience to be able to combine and advance his stories and practices in mine too. And he and I have even taught some classes together on Hoshin Kanri and strategy deployment. So we continue our partnership too, which has been great. You just mentioned reflections and having that workbook for people to capture their reflections. And I'm just curious, what about your reflections? Mm. This has been a year of, as Tracy just listed and you just described, new workshops, uh, the whirlwind of dealing with COVID and mm -hmm. what has come out of the book. What about you? What have you learned? Yeah, you know, so I've learned so much. Um, there, there are some things that have really resonated with me kind of building off of the stories from Mr. Yoshino and what I've been talking to people about. And the concept of, of failure and challenge is really one that has resonated with people. You know, there's the um, Japanese saying, and I'm going to hold up my Daruma, uh, fall down seven times, get up eight. These guys are weighted at the bottom and represent that um, of the tenacity and patience we have to have to move forward. And you know, this has been a challenging year for, uh, for, for everyone in different ways. And so how can we see challenge and setbacks um, as an opportunity for growth as well and see sort of, I guess, the beauty in the challenge? And, and granted, there's <laughs> some challenges are bigger than others, but, but how do we keep going forward? Because that's what life is about. So how do we keep getting up um, and moving forward. And so that's been a big lesson. Well, I don't know if it's a lesson for me, but it's a relearning and a deeper appreciation for that concept of what it means to fall down seven times and get up eight and the inspiration that other people have had from that experience. Uh, and then the other thing that I have learned or maybe got enriched would be a better word to say is the fundamental concept of what I'm now calling the leading to learn framework that I reference throughout the book. And it was inspired from a quote that I, from the very first time I heard Mr. Yoshino speak in 2014, before we actually started um, meeting together in person when I was living in Japan. And that's just the essence of leadership is that a leader's role is about setting the direction, providing support and develop to people and then developing themselves. And that like, I keep repeating this over and over again. And it's, I, I realize how just the, it's like, the essential components and it's so simple and yet there's so much within all of those. So how do you create clarity of where we need to go? How do you then create the systems and structures and support to be able to help people learn their way to get there? And then how do we start with ourselves as well? And that's just so fundamental. And um, so I guess I have a deeper appreciation for the simplicity of that um, and the essence of leadership. Well, Thank you for that. 
I, um, I want to go back to something that you said about this last year as well. And that was, you know, you're, you, you did a lot of things and all of it was virtual. And mm. then you saw and heard a need for different things. So you created the workbook and then you had these different workshops and you're, you've connected with people virtually, which I'm sure nobody expected. I mean, you didn't want to launch a book virtually, mm. and then you're connecting with the audience virtually too. You, you've done book clubs and other additional workshops. And what, what are you finding people have, what's really resonated for them in, t- in talking and engaging with the, your followers, really? What, yeah. what are you finding? Is it the same that you're reflecting or is it different to some of the different takeaways for them? Yeah. So a, a few, few things that come to my mind when you talk about that. Yeah. It's that the concept of connection is so important and that we can have, we can actually really create space to have really positive and meaningful connection, even virtually. And I think that's actually one of my strengths. It's actually, I've always been a connector and being able to bring that energy forward and create a space and a structure for people to connect on a real genuine human level. And so everything that I do, even if it's a small workshop, it's about how do we start creating those genuine human connections? It's not just about who we are or what we do, but it's like, I always talk about the heart. It's like, what's important to us? And then how do we align our actions? And this is what I call leading and living with intention. Uh, But the I think that's really resonating with people as well, that we could sit on, um, you know, we can sit on a Zoom meeting and be totally disengaged, or we can come away feeling really just inspired and connected and um, filled with positivity and support. And, and so I, I've been really, something that's really been meaningful to me is to be able to both participate in community spaces like that, as well as facilitate and enable it to happen. Uh, you know, for example, I led this, what I, the Leading to Learn Accelerator, which was 10 people, 20 people from 10 different countries using the work, the workbook and the book as a framework for learning. And yet we really created this amazing space over 60 days for people to come together. And it like, it lit me up to be able to see so much um, learning, but also connection from around the world. And um, that just, it's been it's been really important. And I think one of the things that I've been hearing too, no matter where people are in the world, that desire for genuine human connection and also to learn and to be able to learn together uh, is really uh, just is a constant that happens through any of the groups that I've been participating in. Um, so that's been, that's been one of the benefits, I think, of the pandemic. It's really opened us up to even global connections in a way that maybe um, not everyone was used to before. So Given all that and what you've learned and what you've experienced, what's next for you? Ah, so, well, a few things. So the book anniversary is coming up and in this wonderful room right here, I have recently finished recording the audio book for Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn. And that's coming out in July, assuming that everything gets approved from the quality control people uh, behind the scenes. So I'm really excited for that. And um, I'm continuing to build my uh, just more more community. So more opportunities to work with me in different capacities and workshops. And that's been really exciting as well. Um, and I am looking forward to getting back in person, but the audio book is the big thing that's coming out and the book's being translated into a few different languages right now. And so it just is really meaningful that all of the hours and the years spent unpacking Mr. Yoshino's stories and going deeper and weaving the warp and the weft of his life story together is having an opportunity to um, inspire a lot of people. In fact, um, it was interesting, it was wonderful. I got a email from a colleague earlier this week and he said, I'm reading your book for the third time and I'm finding richness in the stories in a way that I, you know, I keep learning something new each time. And I really had that same experience, even when I was reading, <laughs> reading the audio, you know, the, the, the book again. I mean, I know these stories in, in, in and out so well. And yet I was still finding myself um, kind of reflecting on things in it from a different perspective. And even Mr. Yoshino said that when we were reviewing the manuscript last year, he was like getting caught up in his own story. And I think that's the power of story and the power of, um, 
of, a, of reflection as well is that we can take different things at different times in our life um, and see things from different angles. And um, so I thought that was, I was, I really appreciated hearing that from my colleague that he was taking something more and seeing that his purpose could be redefined um, as he grew into another stage of his life and career. Mm. Yes, I, um, I'm really, really taking in what you're saying. And <laughs> it, it's sort of like when you watch a movie, I, I think I've said this before, it's when you, it's like when you watch a movie, but you're at a different stage in your life and things speak to you differently. And that's what I love about this book, your book too, because it is, it's stories, it's leadership. We're, we should be developing continuously, right? Mm -hmm. Constantly. And where we are on the journey affects what messages we're ready to hear. Mm -hmm. And so that's a lovely part about the stories in the book that you've written mm -hmm. uh, that is really exciting because people, it's not a one and done. <laughs> right. So how, um, so what's next? You, you talked a little bit about that. How, what's the involvement with Mr. Yoshino? Do you have things that you're going to be doing with Mr. Yoshino? They're going to be um, where he's going to be involved in some of these workshops and events. Yeah, absolutely. So he and I talk at least every other week still, which has been, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's a special relationship for us. And so it's been fun to partner together to lead a few workshops earlier this year in Hoshin Conry. Um, I'm planning a celebration event this summer. So stay tuned um, on social media for that. And of course you too will get a personal invitation, um, but we, we were just working out some of the back end logistics of when he is available. And of course, planning on um, engaging in some other activities together, probably building on some of the Hoshin workshops or leadership workshops that we have led together. And then he's an integral part of my Leading to Learn Accelerator and some of the other programs. So people have an opportunity to actually ask questions to him. And he, he loves talking with people and uh, about his experience and really helping people. And I think that's part of how we have connected so much um, from the very beginning. And one of the other special things about the book is it's really allowed him to connect with more people. He was, he was really enjoying traveling. You know, he's 77 now, was enjoying before traveling to the US and to Europe and to Canada to engage with groups and speak at conferences. And so that that shut down, of course it did for all of us. And now he's still having with technology an opportunity to be part of workshops. He's um, talking to classes in Montreal at, at a university, some other, he's been part of other university programs too. And so I'm really grateful um, too that this has been an opportunity for him to continue to fulfill his purpose, even though he hasn't been able to travel. Mm -hmm. So in terms of what's next, the other big piece or what I'm really curious about is your Japan study trips. Yay. And this is where we met you. This is where we met Mr. Yoshino and got to travel extensively on the other side of the world uh, with you. So I know you had to cancel at least two of your trips, uh, which is, was so sad and just uh, another tragedy of this pandemic. But are you bringing them back? Yes, I'm super um, excited. I do, yay! I, and Mr. Yoshino uh, will be part of them as well. So I have a trip scheduled um, for later this fall. Um, we're just having to see, of course, how that, um, how the current, I guess the next few months pan out with that. But if your people are interested in contacting me for that, of course, let me know. And then I just set dates for 2022 in May and in October as well. So applications for those programs will open up soon and available on my website. So KBJ Anderson forward slash Japan trip. And I can't wait to get back to Japan. It was so much fun to host both of you in Japan and not only for an enriched learning experience, but also like we had a lot of fun and well, you can, you can, t you, you can talk all about that, but uh, yeah, I'm, I can't wait. And I really miss, you know, this is the longest time it's been since I haven't been to Japan nor have I not seen Mr. Yoshino. So I'm really eager to get back and yes. uh, can't wait to, can't wait to lead some more amazing trips in 2022. And 
Um, yeah, this would be great. Well, Elizabeth and I were just reminiscing about some of our favorite moments from that trip. I mean, besides, of course, meeting you and Mr. Yoshino and getting to spend some time with him, we were joking about how we were going to flank him on the on the on the bus. You know, I'm on his left, Elizabeth's on his right. But I think one of my favorite was one of our first trips was to the elementary school. Mm. And really observing the, the Japanese kids and how they had that standard work for lunch. But it was also important, I mean, how they were integrating respect for others, respect for your environment at a very early age, and also really focused on reducing waste. Like, I, I think one of the most compelling, very small thing is... First, children, look at your food. And if you don't think you can eat it, put some back, <laughs> like assess and then and then decide. And then all of the meals were eaten completely. Right. So what? Really? I, I thought that was kind of amazing. So there were so many learnings just at the elementary school. What was one of your favorites, Elizabeth? That one, that concept of deep regret for waste that has never left me, that what you just described. Mm -hmm. The other huge one, which I was excited about from the start was Ina Foods or Ina Foods. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but I had just read Tree Ring Management uh, by the, what he's now the chairman. Yeah. I think his son is running the company now, yeah. but being able to go there, go to Ina Valley and just see his principle in action, which was everything was about employee happiness. Mm -hmm. So you saw images of Kaizens that were going on. They were all up in the lunchroom and some of them would just be, What's a better way to get from the floor to this panel without endangering yourself? And so building a, a little stair and a bridge to protect the employee. But you felt it in the beauty of the grounds that everybody collaborated to bring these gorgeous plants to life. And people traveled from all over to come see that. And the food we ate was incredible and there was an art gallery just beauty in all respects uh and what and that being driven by you know in this need or this goal of employee happiness and then learning that toyota was sending managers here that they were learning from ina foods and i was so gratified thinking that's just fantastic that people want to learn like well how does that work if you try to, you know, focus on employee happiness. Well, it works really well. They've been around for a long time and they've grown and it slowly, but well. So that was amazing to me. And I just want to add something to that. Like that was a big aha moment for me because when we got to Ina Foods and we were asking him about employee engagement and we're like, well, what do you use to measure? And he's like, what are you talking about? Do you, do you survey your family? On, on family engagement. And that's when it just hit me right between the eyes. Like, this is so not how we do it in America. I mean, it was family. I mean, it, that didn't make any sense to him. And that blew me away. Yeah, they knew how their people were because they knew their people and their families. That, was, yeah. that wasn't a question. Yeah. Another, and obviously we, you kind of took us on a supply chain tour, like through tier one, tier two suppliers to Toyota and then ending at a Toyota plant and there, and, and the, each supplier was fascinating. How did they apply different aspects of what we know as lean or different techniques that we're familiar with? What did, how did that manifest? How does man, visual management work here? So that was just a kind of a, a Disneyland walk of like, mm -hmm. wow, this is happening real time. And then the other piece was when we finally got to Toyota, that it felt like we were watching car ballet, yes. you know, watching these, you know, lines of, of uh, doors going off to the right and chassis going down below. And it was just kind of gorgeous. It, it is gorgeous. I've been to Toyota factories now, um, gosh, almost 10 times in, in Japan. And it's, I've been to other car manufacturers as well. And it's so quiet at Toyota. It really is this ballet. And it's also just it's peaceful. It's amazing. The synchronicity mm -hmm. and you go to like, I've been to Isuzu and some other places where it's like, you know, it, it's actually kind of loud and you're like, Ooh, it's as real feels like a factory. So I, it's, it's amazing. It really is gets back to though, this concept that Mr. Yoshino shared with me, like the only secret though to Toyota is its attitude towards learning. Mm -hmm. And what I think is really powerful too, is that they share that learning in the process of learning with others. And that's why the suppliers of Toyota have also been able to achieve so much because Toyota has invested 
in their relationship with people so that they too can learn all of course, so that they can achieve the outcomes they need to for delivering high quality products at the end of the line for their customers. But again, they focus on that people and the connection and the learning process together. And, and I think we often miss that a lot here in the West. We get very focused on our little piece of things and we're focused more on the outcome than the learning process. And we miss so much in about people, Tracy, to build on like that concept. It's, it's about learning, but it's also about the, the respect for humanity and where that comes from like happiness and joy and satisfaction. And it doesn't mean that you don't do hard work or there's not challenging times, but if we can connect on that genuine human level, I, that transcends so much. And um, so how do we bring it back to the heart? <laughs> yes. And that that's probably the final comment we'll have on the tour is it, it was so much fun. The group was awesome. Just working and connecting with all the people that were on the tour, you, and I forgot her name. Who was the, 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 the translator? Oh, mommy, um, mommy son. Yes. Yes. She was awesome. And it was just great to go out to dinner. And if people needed a time, you know, a break, maybe at night, they could go to their rooms, but most people gathered and we got to know everybody. And we still in contact with a lot of people that were on the tour. And it was just, it was just, and that karaoke night, well, you know, what happens on karaoke night stays on karaoke night, but boy, was that fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. The onsen. Our biggest uh, moment. Yeah, our biggest moment, but also just a beautiful place, the onsen, which is the hot springs, the natural hot springs up in the mountain that the mm. whole inn was built around that. And that was part of our getting together. And that was gorgeous. Yeah, it, it was awesome. Well, it was so important to me to not only show you the business side and the learning side, of course, going to the school, but also some of the culture, because I, if you go to Japan and don't have an opportunity to experience some of the countryside and some of the genuine hospitality of Japan, you're missing out on a huge part. The motanashi, the, the customer service and the beauty that comes in the ryokans and the, um, you know, just engaging with actual like, Japanese people um, outside of a, a, a factory environment is really powerful. Mm -hmm. I will say during COVID, obviously we all binged on Netflix and looked for ways to connect in the world uh, on screen. And I went back to something you tipped us off to before going to okay. Japan to help us understand culturally what we were walking into. Mm -hmm. And that was Tokyo Stories. Mm -hmm. And that is just a tiny uh, shop open. Oh, the Midnight Diner, the Midnight Diner. I think he was open from midnight to seven in the morning. And it's just this really tiny microcosm of, you know, the, the chef is the master. But I, I loved watching because it, it just brought me back to all of that feeling of how culturally different and caring mm. it was when we were in Japan. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. A really different uh, aesthetic and, and connection, which I loved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious to see how... Um, Japan has been impacted by by COVID, particularly all these small, small oh. shops that, you know, restaurants that sat, you know, 10 people maximum and little tiny bars. And I'm curious on how they've been able to sustain or not um, and, and how this has shaped the tenor of, of Japan. I mean, it's it impacted, you know, us all globally. So I'm really eager to get back and, uh, mm -hmm. and share the experience with other people too that I know. Yeah. Japan's eager to have us once, you know, COVID's under control. And wow. Tracy and I, if we had our, um, if we got to do what we wanted to do, would be to join you again and oh. go to Japan again. It would be Yay. so fantastic. Yes. I was just going to say that as well, that I can, I'm not convinced that that was my only trip no. with Katie. No. To Japan. <laughs> no, there'll be future ones. Maybe it'll be Japan tour part two, like for people who've already gone once and then we get some new places and uh, continue to enrich uh, your learning and fun. So <laughs> maybe that's learning. our last question for you is, uh, I'm guessing there's probably some elements that are standard that you're going to keep in your Japan study tour and then there will be new ones too. So yeah. um, what, what kinds of things that we experience that are probably mainstay or is it all kind of up in the air? Well, you know, uh, well, of course we have to check in with everyone now with, um, post COVID, but the plan will be fairly, fairly similar. I want, I mean, at least from the learning objective. So some of the companies themselves may change, but the learning objective of being able to experience 
um, some sort of supply chain of, of Toyota. So going to the Nagoya area in, in the heartland of Toyota City and experiencing some companies who haven't, aren't connected to Toyota and what they're doing as well. So Ina and then of course my, my good friends at um, Ogura, Mrs. Ogura. Uh, you know, and then there'll be some adjustments um, along the way too. I still um, would love to take people to the elementary school. Again, we have to make, you know, well, some of this is COVID dependent and so we're having to do it, but those are, those learning experiences to me are the foundation, the specifics may change. And of course, having great opportunities to have food and cultural experiences. And I'm so excited, the people who have signed up for the, the trips um, coming up, it's another just a dynamic group of international leaders who it's, I'm just, I think for me, it's not, not only the Japan part, but the people who come on these trips with me um, are just so awesome. <laughs> I really create lifelong friendships with everyone uh, such as you. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's been, it's been great. So yeah, more to come, but we're working on the itineraries right now, but the, the, the learning themes are all there and the sort of overall structure of the program will be uh, similar. And I look forward to in the future ho hosting both of you in Japan for some more great, um, great experiences. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, it's always nice seeing you, Katie. And Fantastic. Beyond in the cafe and outside of the cafe. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I, likewise. And I, it really is that genuine friendship. I mean, it's amazing to me that we only met, you know, three, I guess it was three years ago. And then you came into Japan with me two years ago. Uh, so, yeah. so wonderful. And I'd love to connect to everyone who's listening or watching here today. You can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. And of course, my website, kbjanderson.com. And go celebrate. If you haven't um, had a chance to learn from or be inspired by Mr. Yoshino stories, please check out Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn. Uh, and you can get your audio book um, version coming out in, <laughs> in July. Uh, in this wonderful recording studio. I had it set up a little bit differently, but yeah. So thank you so much, both of you. Um, it's my pleasure to be in the Just In Time Cafe here today <laughs> and drinking my coffee and getting started on my day with the two of you. Cheers. 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 <laughs> Bye, Katie. Stay tuned for information about our July 8th webinar with Tracy Defoe, where she educates us on Toyota Kata, where Kata means practice. Specifically, it's the practice of experimenting to get to a desired state. There's a growing community of Kata fans, lots of workshop, and the Kata conferences are multiplying around the globe. So come learn what all the buzz is about. Also sign up for our July 22nd webinar with Jessica House and Karen Ross about the five C's of, phys of psychological safety. As we move back into the workplace, many people are questioning the nature of their work cultures. There's a growing movement for lots of folks to stay at home. Uh, and Karen and Jessica has developed a model for making our places of work places we want to come back to. So come join us for both of these webinars. They'll be great. And tune in for next month's podcast episode where we interview Debbie Sears Barnard a global healthcare executive with over 20 years of experience in the area of strategic deployment and prioritizing quality as a core business strategy. She'll be joining us from Dubai, where she's on assignment as a consultant for the Joint Commission International. So we're happy summer is here and we're lucky to have your company. The Just In Time Cafe is always better with all of you. And you always know where to come and get your jolt of lean caffeine.